Hi Year 11. So retrieval roulette. Uh, pause, answer the questions and then unpause whenever you're ready to get marking them. Okay, here's the answer. So get marking and then um, yeah, unpause whenever you're ready to start with today's lesson. Okay, so this next section in our notes is called applications of forces. So there's a few different like mini topics within it and it's still to do with forces obviously but it is the forces put into a more practical sense i suppose so we're going to start off here today looking at hooke's law now um there is a little experiment to go along with hooke's law so we'll do that probably as a demo whenever we're back in school after easter but we can go through all the theory stuff on it today okay so um Whenever we're talking about Hooke's Law here, really, um, I'm going to be talking mostly about springs and things, but everything that we're talking about does apply to um, like regular materials too. Uh, so like if you had a section of metal, it would still apply here, but the, it's just easier to see what's going on whenever it's a spring. Okay, so just before we start, a couple of bits of the, the terminology. So the natural length of a spring, I'm going to just use my wee diagrams here. I don't have one at home um, that I can use to demonstrate, sorry. But the natural length of the, the spring is just the, the length of it whenever there's no force being applied to it. So you're not hanging any masses off it. You're not pulling at it or anything. So there's no force. Um, it's just sitting there minding its own business. The natural length um, is just the length from the top to the bottom. The extended length then is pretty self-explanatory. It is the length once you do start to apply a force to that. So that could be from hanging a wee set of weights or from pulling the, the um, spring with a particular force, but um, the extended length is just the length whenever a particular force is acting on it. So then the next thing we need to know is the extension. So the extension is just the difference between the extended length and the natural length. So in questions, they will probably give you the original length of the spring and then they will ask or they'll say whenever a force of such and such is added, this is the new length uh, and you'll have to figure out the extension because it's extension that ends up going into the equation. So that's it there. The extension is just the extended length to take away the natural length. OK, so I think that is pretty self-explanatory. So over on page 209 is the experiment. And as I say, we will do that whenever we're back in school. Um, I don't think you'll be able to do it, but um, I can do one just as a demo for us, okay? Um, all we do in this experiment is we get our spring, we measure the original length or the natural length, and then we hang different masses from the spring and measure the new length or the extended length every single time. Um, and then we keep on doing that for a big range of forces. So we just would record our results in a table like this. So with a load of one Newton, we have, well, sorry, we would have recorded the natural length up at the start with a load of one Newton, what our extended length was. And then from that, we can calculate our extension just by taking away this original length. And then we would keep on going and then we would end up drawing a graph of force on the y-axis against extension on the x-axis. So we're going to continue on here today as if we had done that, even though we haven't. Um, but <laughs> broken record, we will do it whenever we're back in school, OK? Now, when we do that experiment, what we should find is that we get a graph roughly like this. Now, I can nearly guarantee whenever we do it, we'll not get um, this whole section. It will maybe just start to curve off a little bit and then our spring will break on us. But we generally find that up to a particular size of force, the, the force would be directly in proportional to the extension. So by that I mean for every Newton that you would add on, the spring would extend by the same amount every time. So if we look at our graph there, we, we should see that. So every roughly two Newtons, it's a bit off actually, it's going up by um, one centimetre on this wee dodgy graph here. OK, so because it's a straight line through the origin, that means the two things would be directly proportional to each other. Now, see this wee section here where the force is directly proportional to each other? That's whenever Hooke's law is applying to the spring or to the material. But eventually the spring will reach a point where Hooke's law doesn't apply anymore. And again, I can show you this in school um, whenever we have a spring and we, if you apply a force to it, 
okay, and then you take the force off, the spring will return back up to its original position, okay, and as long as that keeps happening, we would describe that as being elastic behavior. So see the way here, we've labeled that on the graph as elastic deformation. That's because up until this point here, whenever we ret uh, remove the force, the spring would return to its original length. Now, there is a, a limit of proportionality and that's just going to be a particular force dependent on the material that the spring would be made out of. And then once your force goes past that point, your spring no longer returns to its original length. So I'm sure you have done that with a spring. You've stretched it, you've applied a big force, stretched it so much that it doesn't return to its original length. Once you're into that region and it doesn't return, then we say that's plastic deformation or we would say the spring is behaving plastically. Okay, so Hooke's law, which I haven't even looked at yet, it's just up above this, it only applies whenever our yeah, whenever the spring is behaving elastically. So it's only really up to this point here on the graph. This is something that you might be asked to state. So we'll need to learn it. So Hooke's law states that the extension of a spring, and we use E for the extension, is directly proportional to the applied force F, provided the limit of proportionality has not been reached. So that just means Hooke's law applies up until this limit of proportionality. Once you've gone past that force that makes it stretch so much that it doesn't return, then uh, Hooke's law doesn't apply anymore. Okay, now let's have a look through the rest of these notes. So that's what it's saying down here. Between points A and B, here and here, the spring is obeying Hooke's law. The force is directly proportional to the extension. You know it because it's a straight line through the origin. This is known as elastic behaviour. When a material deforms elastically, it will return to its original length and shape when the load is removed. Uh, when a material is behaving elastically, force is directly proportional to extension. Now, some of you have maybe done this in maths um, now, some of you maybe haven't, but if you have two things which are directly proportional to each other, it just means that there's gonna be a constant that links them. So in other words, um, no matter what the, the size of the extension is, if you multiply it by this certain number, then you're going to get the force, right? So it could be like F equals 2E. So for every extension you have, if you double it, that gives you the size of the force. F equals 0.64E. If that's it, then the constant would be 0.64. Now, in maths, you will, if you haven't done this yet, you will eventually, but Whenever you have two things which are directly proportional to each other like that, you can rewrite it as F is equal to some constant multiplied by E. And this equation here is the equation for Hooke's Law. It's just over the page. Let's have a look at it. Okay, so up on page 211. When two quantities are proportional to each other, it means there must be a constant that relates them to each other. So in this case, if we divide any f value by its corresponding e value, we'll always get the same number. And we can try that uh, whenever we do the experiment. I will forget, so remind me, okay? <laughs> Promise me you'll remind me. So um, we should always get the same number, and that number is the constant that relates them. So we tend to use k for this constant, so that f is proportional to e can be written as f equals k e. Here's what the letters stand for. So f is the force in newtons. Um, I'll go to E next. E is the extension. Now, if that's recorded in metres, then our K, which is the spring constant, is what the way we'll call that, um, would be in newtons per metre. Now, say our extension was in millimetres, then our spring constant would be newtons per millimetre. If our extension was in centimetres, our spring constant would be newtons per centimetre. And that's just all that I have written down in that little bit there in your notes. Okay. Now, one of my favourite things, we're going to also look about um, ways we can figure out this k value, okay? So anytime we do this Hooke's Law experiment, we do end up plotting this graph of force against extension. And up until the limit of proportionality, we will get a straight line through the origin, which means um, they're directly proportional to each other. But if we have a little look at this, f equals ke, and we compare it to the equation of a straight line, y equals mx plus c, right? We've got f on our y-axis of our graph. We've got e on our x-axis of our graph. 
So that must mean that this constant k can be found from finding the gradient of our graph. Remember the rise over run to get the gradient? And see the way we've got nothing lining up here with the plus c? That's because it's going through the origin. Do you remember the plus c is the y-intercept? So because our graph is going through the origin, we don't have a plus c in it. Okay, so that's just all I've said down there. f is plotted on the y-axis, e is plotted on the x-axis. This means that the gradient of the force extension graph is equal to the spring constant k. And that's the type of thing that you'd maybe get asked to figure out in a question. Like you'd either give, be given the values or the graph and have to calculate a k. So over on 212, we just have um, that little bit of information. I feel like I have said this to you a few times this year, though. Um, so these skills of interpreting graphs, comparing with equations and calculating constants um, are a very important part in physics. And they can appear in any form in your exam. So like with an unknown equation, but you just have to be able to apply that knowledge. So that's why we keep sneaking them in every so often here. Anyway, back to Hooke's Law. Um, if you have a spring that is stiff, it's going to have a very large value of k, which means that because k is equal to the gradient of that graph, it means that graph would be steeper. So we've we'll tried to show that down here. Um, if a spring is easy to extend, then k would be a smaller value and your graph would be less steep. So um, with this we want here, this first graph here has a steeper gradient, so this is going to be a really stiff spring whereas this one here not so stiff so again that could be something they could ask you like they could give you a graph like that and say um which one which spring is stiffer one or two and then that's testing that you know that the the stiffness relates to k and the bigger the k the bigger the gradient okay um let me see if a load higher than the proportional limit that should really be limit of proportionality uh, is applied to the spring the material starts to behave plastically this means it will be permanently deformed and will not return to its original length um, and shape when the load is removed so this is after point b in our graph so that's talking about this graph here back on 210 so over here um the 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 I can't speak the material is behaving plastically so that it's not going to return to its original length and actually what you'll find is a small increase in force causes it to extend a lot then okay now we've got oh that there shouldn't be 75 that should be 210 i want us to write down a little example here down on 212 okay okay here we go so get this um question written down for me so a spring has a natural length of 24 centimeters a force of one newton stretches the spring 0.4 centimeters Calculate the force needed to stretch the spring to a total length of 60 centimetres. This isn't quite as straightforward as it first seems. So pause, get that written down, and then unpause and we'll start. So um, let's see, if we go back to the start here, the natural length of the spring, I'm just gonna record that as L, right? So L is 24 centimetres. A force of one Newton, there we go. A force of one Newton stretches the spring 0.4 centimeters so that's an extension of 0.4 centimeters calculate the force needed to stretch the spring to a total length of 60 I'm not listing that just yet okay see the way we have F and E then that means we can use these to figure out what the spring constant is for this uh, spring and then we can apply that to our new situation whenever it's um, stretched to a length of 60. So we'll do that first. So F equals KE, force is one, K is what we're trying to find, and E is 0.4. So if we divide both sides of our equation by 0.4, we end up getting that K is 2.5, and our units, newtons per centimeter. Because I put my extension in there in centimetres, that must be the value, or the unit, sorry, for k. So, now we know that original length of the spring, 24. k is 2.5 newtons per centimetre. And now, for our second situation, we are being asked to calculate the force whenever its total length is 60 centimeters now if its original length was 24 
and its new length was 60. That means our extension is 36 centimeters. So you can see why people would very easily go wrong in that. A lot of people would just put 60 in as the extension, but it's not. 60 is the new length that it has reached and it was originally 24. So these are the values that we're going to use in our calculation. And we're just using our equation f equals ke. It's okay, 2.5 and extension 36. That gets 90 newtons. Check. Does it make sense? Is it significantly bigger? Yes. Yeah. Happy days. Okay. Get that down for me. Right. Turn over to 213. Now, there's going to be a lot of pausing and unpausing here. If you can give this here question here a go, and then, um, so pause and do it, and then unpause, and I'm going to go through it. Okay. Right, so if you're still watching, you better have given this question a go. Promise. Okay, so a student is investigating Hooke's Law. She applied different loads to the same helical spring. She obtained the following incomplete set of results. Uh, copy the student's results table and complete the last row. So, see here with the load of zero and the length of the spring was six. That must mean that the original length of the spring is six centimeters. So the extension there, zero. Um, with this load of 3 and the length of the spring is 8, well that's an extension then of 2. And if you keep on applying that, then once it had reached 10, if its original length was 6, its extension is 4. 12, original length 6, extension 6. 14, original length 6, <laughs> extension 8. Okay, explain whether or not Hooke's Law was obeyed. Well, yes it was. And we know that because um, the force is directly proportional to the extension. So there's a couple of ways you can tell that. See the way that's going up by the same amount every time, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, um, as the load is increasing. Another way you can tell it, if as one of them doubles, the other one doubles, then the two things are directly proportional to each other. And that's what Hooke's Law is, force and extension being directly proportional to each other. So see if we look here, 3 to 6. 2 to 4, yeah, it's doubled. 6 to 12, 4 to 8, yeah, both of them have doubled. So yes, because force is directly proportional to the extension. Okay, um, same here. Give question 1 a go. So pause, give question 1 a go, and then unpause, and I'll go through it. Okay, right, done. So the table shows the total length of a spring obeying Hooke's law when different loads are applied. So we've got a load of two and a load of three. Oh, what extension is produced in the spring by a load of one newton? Well, see, increasing from a load of two to three, that's increasing by a load of one newton, and the length has extended by three centimeters. So that means if there was only one applied here, it would be three centimeters before this, if that makes sense. So, um, Oh, here that's done. I think I've actually answered B there. Hold on. So for A, what extension is produced in the spring by a load of one newton? Um, every newton produces an extension of three centimeters. Okay. Um, and you can tell that just because this is a difference in one and this has gone up by three. Now, what I had to actually start the answer, I think, was part B. Calculate the original length of the spring. So, see if I just work backwards here. In fact, you know what? I might even do it like a wee table. Our load and our length in centimetres. Whenever the load was 3, the length was... Oh, jeez, I'm not even on the screen. The length was 15. Whenever the load was 2, the length was 12. So, whenever the load was 1, the length must have been 9. And whenever the load was zero, the length must have been six. So six centimetres is the original length of that. Oh, now, question two is what we've just done as example on what page was it? 212. So we don't have to do that. That is that example that we've done. Okay. Um, and question three I think we'll leave it for whenever we're back.
Okay, again, I'll probably forget back no I won't. Um, so we will leave probably question three for now and these textbook questions and then that means we'll have some questions to do after we've done our experiment on this as well. Okay, so that is everything for today. I will see you after Easter. Bye.